Hello, thank you for joining us again. This is Austin Holmes from the Terry Eye Institute, and this is the third part of our series. Today we'll be discussing other applications in ophthalmology using a smart device, archiving, billing, and advanced communication. First, let's talk about some other applications. A useful application of smart devices is regular old external photographs. In this particular case, we had a patient come in who was complaining of their new glasses that we prescribed them. She was stating that it was blurry in the distance and that she noticed too much change in the power with small movements of her head. When we marked the optical centers, we found that the glasses were sitting too high and that the optical center on the left lens was too far temporally. When we showed the patient, she immediately understood, and also we sent the picture with her to where she bought the glasses, and they changed the lenses for her without any question. As we discussed in the last lecture series, taking a funnest photograph using a handheld lens and a slit lamp is very, very difficult. And because of this, we've developed what we call the duet. This utilizes a 20 diopter lens from your clinic that you place into the front of the system and the iPhotodoc adapter. As you can see from some of the initial images that we've been able to capture, it takes very clear quality images. Now again, this is still a prototype, so it's one of the future directions that we're taking smart device ophthalmic photography. Another concept we've been kind of playing around with is using the iPhotodoc on the surgical scope. This has a lot of uh, uses and advantages. As you can see from the image on the upper left hand side, you can see Dr. Terry performing a procedure in our minor procedure room and um, he's being assisted by one of our technicians. One of the biggest advantages is that the technician or the assistant can monitor what's going on during the procedure and still have very quick and efficient access to instruments and can he easily hand them to the, the surgeon. Another advantage of using uh, a smart device during a surgery is that the surgery or procedure can be recorded for later review and also to show the patient what had occurred. Now that we have the videos and photos, we need to uh, store them and be able to retrieve them for later use. Now on that note, one of the more frequent questions we get is about HIPAA. And HIPAA only applies to protected health information, which is individually identifiable health information that identifies the individual or for which there is a reasonable basis to believe it can be used to identify the individual. Um, that quote was taken directly from the CMS website. Based on this and from opinions we've gotten from uh, legal consultants, most ophthalmic photos are not considered protected health information. Uh, the one possible exception would be external photos where um, you're taking a picture of either glasses or uh, even a partial uh, shot of the face um, that you might be able to identify someone with. So for that, we would consider protected health information but slit lamp photographs or retinal photographs, however, would not. Uh, another question that comes up is, if I do use a third-party storage device, um, do I need to have a business associate agreement with them? And again, this only applies if you're storing uh, protected health information. Another stipulation of that is if the company does use or disclose uh, protected health information, um, you would have to have a business associate agreement. If even if you were using protected health information and they did not use or disclose that information, then you would not need a business associate agreement. So just to kind of re uh, recap, most ophthalmic photos are not considered protected health information. And if you do have ones that are considered protected health information, you probably wouldn't need a business associate agreement if that company does not use or disclose that information. But you would have to definitely um, check up with that company you're interested in using to see if they do or don't. Now it's always best to assume that um, our photos will be considered protected health information just to kind of cover ourselves. So for HIPAA compliance there's a couple do's. You want to use um, medical record numbers or other non-identifying numbers 
um, such as a proprietary chart number or patient identification number. Um, and you also want to make sure that the you have password protection on devices storing the photographs. So on your iPhone to have a passcode or on different programs that are available to, um, to have also a password on that as well too. Um, again, you don't want to use identifiable photographs or limit the amount of identifiable photographs that you use. And you definitely never want to use the patient's name, social security number, date of birth, phone number, or any other identifying or identifiable uh, information. Now the program we personally use in our clinic is Evernote. This is a great program for a couple different reasons. One is that it's password protected. Uh, you can store the notes using patient number. It's easy to use. You can create multiple notebooks um, based on conditions or if you're involved in clinical trials. You can separate the, the trial photographs from your clinical photographs. And you can also tag notes with keywords such as uh, conditions or by clinical trial numbers or whatever that you want to use. With some EHRs, it is possible to link up photographs um, from the smart devices. Some of the methods we've heard, heard about is either directly linking it into the, um, the patient's note, uh, uh, linking it up through Dropbox, or emailing it into the EHR system. Um, every EHR is a little bit different, so you have to work with your EHR provider to determine what's the best solution and also um, any connectivity issues. You can bill for smart device ophthalmic photography. Um, the code I have here, CPT92285, is for anterior chamber photography. A couple points to consider when billing this code is it is a bilateral code, so you get paid the same whether you take a picture of one eye or both eyes. The photos must aid in diagnosis, treatment, and assessing disease progression. And for the most part, that's the most common reason why we're taking photographs to assess uh, the progression of disease. The last point to consider is that there has to be proof that digital photos exist. And this is either they have to be linked up in the patient's chart in the EHR system, or if paper charts are still being used or you're unable to link the photos, you have to make a notation in the patient's chart of where those photos are being stored and what the findings were. Now one of the most powerful uses of smart devices when doing ophthalmic photography is outside communication either with a patient, um, with fellow doctors, or with um, family members of patients. The most common way of outside communication with patients or doctors is to email the photographs from the camera roll and listed here are the steps um, to take when doing this. One thing we've been experimenting with is a program called Group Email. And this, this is a pretty powerful program in that you can send it to multiple people and you can use templates. So for instance, on the second to left photograph, you can see that I have a template for dry eyes and I have a template for glaucoma. You could have a template for whatever condition um, that you want to make one up for. You can also add um, an audio recording, you can put documents, you can put multiple photos or videos. And the nice thing is, is you're not limited to just one of these. You can put all of those into the same email. So here's a, an example, um, a quick example. I used the glaucoma template to um, put in the information uh, regarding glaucoma and this could be a lot more extensive um, explaining uh, the the condition and what causes it the high eye pressure um, but I just wanted to put some simple information in uh, just to, to show you um, that it can be done and I included two photographs one of the patient's optic nerve so that way they could have a photographic record of it for the future and also a picture of which drops we had prescribed and the use of those drops so that way it's very clear to the patient and to family members when they get home. The advantage of using email to communicate the treatment regimen is that there's a very definitive record of what was discussed um, so there's no equivocation about that. Now there's a newer program called AirDrop and this allows um, the person who took the photographs to wirelessly share photos with nearby Apple devices. Um, there's two 
times that we could think of that this would be advantageous. The first one is when there's multiple family members in the room with the patient and instead of having everybody kind of huddle around um, the patient and the, the mobile device, you can just airdrop it to everybody in the room. The second time that we can really think of this as being very useful is um, to share it with fellow doctors who are nearby or, or residents um, in a residency program. Now, if a patient wants a record of their photograph but doesn't have an email address or a smart device, you can always airprint it using these steps here. And again, this is another good way to um, communicate with the patient and make sure that they're educated. So this concludes our series, and thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please visit us at www.iphotodoc.com or feel free to email us at iphotodoc.com at gmail.com.